Welcome to the January Pritzker Lecture. My name is Gary Charlow. I work as a manager in the Education Division here at the California Academy of Sciences, which means that I have the honor of introducing this evening's program. Uh, before I do, I'd just like to tell you about a couple of upcoming programs. Our next Pritzker Lecture will be held on February 15th, and we'll be featuring Dr. Bruce Conklin, is one of our newest fellows here at the Academy, and he'll be talking about the latest findings in stem cell research. Um, prior to that, next Tuesday, we'll be kicking off the 2012 conversation of the Herbst Theater series. That's held at the Herbst Theater downtown at 401 Van Ness Avenue, and we do that series with City Arts and Lectures. And the first event will feature Dr. Jane McGonigal, one of the premier voices in the gaming world. And she'll be doing a talk in conversation with Ryan Wyatt, who is the director of the Morrison Planetarium and Visualization Studios here at the Academy. And they'll be talking about the power of gaming. But moving on to this evening's program, I'd like to introduce one of the newest curators here at the Academy. Dr. Luis Rocha joined the Academy last September and is the assistant curator and Follett chair in ichthyology. He comes to us from the University of Texas at Austin's Marine Science Institute. Dr. Roca studied in his home country of Brazil before coming stateside, where he went on to earn his PhD at the University of Florida. And his research focuses on coral reef fishes and why there is such a high degree of biodiversity in tropical coral habitats. He's quite the traveler. He's been to Hawaii, Brazil, the Red Sea, the Western Pacific, the Indian Ocean, South Pacific, Sao Tome off the coast of Africa, Panama, and the Caribbean in search of his work. Without further ado, please join us in welcoming Dr. Luis Rocha. Thanks for the nice words, Gary. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. It's a almost full house, so I'm glad everybody came. I hope I don't put anybody to sleep. I hope I keep everybody's interest. Um, so I want to start the talk. Uh, by just giving a general overview of what I'm going to be talking about. I'll start with this very simple question in biology here, defining what a species is. Uh, then we'll move on to geographic context of speciation, or meaning uh, talking a little bit about what, how one species turns into two or many. Um, and then we'll talk about reef fishes in more specific, and then speciation in reef fishes. And I'll finish with a, a general overview of the work that I'm doing in uh, deep reefs. So, very simple question, one of the most debated ones in biology. What is a species? It's so contentious that there's about, I don't know, 35 definitions of what a species is. I'm not going to go over the entire list, but I'll just give you a few examples. The biological species concept, for example, is one of the most accepted ones. It's the one that says that uh, bio, uh, species are reproductively isolated units. Uh, so they're populations that don't have the, the ability of crossing with other populations. Uh, which one is another good one to give an example of? The ecological species concept, for example, says that species are uh, populations that inhabit different niches. So if you have a different niche, you're a different species, and so on. Um, I always start defining what species is, because if I don't, I talk so much about species in my talk that inevitably somebody will ask me in the end, and I'll have to explain all that. So I'm just going to kill that at the start. Um, so uh, the problem comes from the fact that uh, there are several stages, so the speciation process or the process of becoming or splitting one species into two is not something that is very well defined, it's not something that is black and white. It's a continuous process and uh, all of those uh, concepts at one point or another, they are actually right. So because they are every, every one of them is right, you cannot come to an agreement of which one is the one that you should apply. So at some point, uh, the red here uh, represents agreement, so everybody, at this point, everybody agrees that it's one species. At this point up here, they're so different that everybody agrees it's two species, and the confusion is right in the middle here. Um, so at one point, the two populations start inhabiting different niches, and they could be uh, uh, construed as ecological species, or as being defined as species by, with using the uh, ecological concept. So what's happening lately, and this was proposed by Kevin Descaraz, which is a, a who's a researcher at the Smithsonian, is that one good thing that would probably give somewhat of an end to this uh, debate is to start using qualifiers before the species. So 
if you define the species because they're reproductively isolated, you just say that they're biological species, and nobody will question anything after that. So if you just say that they're species, there's questions. But if you qualify it as a biological or a morphological or an ecological species, um, nobody will question it. The, the definition that I particularly like the most is the taxonomic um, uh, species concept, which simply says that if a specialist, if a taxonomer that is specialist in that particular group says it's a species, then it's a species. So that's how uh, arbitrary those definitions are. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the definition of species actually doesn't apply too much for my research. Yes, I do define, I do describe species a lot. And um, I do name species and I call something a species. But what I'm really interested in is the process, the speciation process. So I'm not really worried about what a species is. I want to know how they're formed. And that brings us to the actual models of, or modes of speciation. So this graph here is a general, uh, gross generalization, and it's just a simple way to describe uh, the three main modes of speciation, allopatric, paleopatric, and sympatric. And these are just big names that represent or in, try to indicate how uh, one population becomes two in geographic context. So the allopatric speciation context, or the allopatric speciation model, I should say, is the one that uh, uh, predicts that a species will become two only in isolation. So we have one, one population in the beginning here. It, this population, at some point in history, is split into by an extrinsic geographic or an external barrier. Um, it can be a mountain range, for example. A mountain range emerges and it splits a, a, a population that was continually distributed into two. With time, those two populations will become isolated, will differentiate, will, uh, and will eventually become two separated units, and the lines here represent uh, reproductive isolation. In the case of parapatric speciation, the uh, complete isolation here is not, com not required. All that is required in parapatric speciation is that the original population gives rise to another population, in, usually in a different habitat, and there's a restriction of gene flow between the old and the new, so, or the two populations. Let's say there's a, a species that inhabit a forest, and then uh, at some point in time, it becomes also uh, common in a, sea, in a uh, meadow hab habitat nearby the forest, it's in a desert habitat nearby the forest. So the, two, the selection pressure in the two habitats would drive those two populations to different, uh, to eventually reproductive isolation. Sympatric speciation, so the parapatric speciation requires that uh, uh, the species are in adjacent habitats. Sympatric speciation doesn't require that. It just requires that one species turns into the other. Uh, and it can be entirely within uh, the other's habitat. So because of this, it's the most contentious uh, mode of all of them. Now, why do I study speciation in reef fishes? Uh, they're a very diverse habitat. This one uh, is a reef at the Hawaiian Islands, and this is our own reef here downstairs, at the Philippine coral reefs. Um, at uh, at uh, any given reef in the Indo-Pacific, you can find as much as 400, 500 species in a small area. And that is a very disproportional diversity. So reefs are a very small habitat. They cover less than 0.1% of the oceans. Yes, they, yet they uh, uh, harbor a very high number of species, about 5,000 species or so, corresponding to 35% of all the marine species of fish. So that is very disproportionate. 35 or more than a third of all the species of marine fish are found in less than 0.1% of the habitat. And uh, a lot of my research uh, is trying to understand why. Why are coral reefs so diverse as opposed to all the other marine habitats? So um, let's give you a little introduction about the coral reefs or fishes. So the coral reef fishes, uh, I would say 95% of them have, have what we call a bipartite life history. So the photos in the left here are larvae, and the photos on the right are the adult fish. The adult fish, they're usually very sedentary. They don't move a lot. And the larvae, they occupy, they, they uh, inhabit the, the pelagic environment. So they're out in the blue water. So a typical butterfly fish, let's say, it spends its entire life in a reef no bigger than this room. But when it spawns, its larvae go out in the open ocean and then can cross hundreds or sometimes thousands of miles, depending on how long this uh, particular larval stage is. So almost all of the families in uh, coral reef fishes, they have this pelagic larval stage. The duration of the larval stage varies a lot. Uh, butterfly fish have a 
somewhat long, larval stage of 35, 40 days. Gobies, the ones in the bottom here, have a very, relatively short larval stage of 10, 15 days. So it depends, oh, it varies uh, between families and it varies between species. Now those larvae are what connect distant habitats, but even the larvae cannot cross certain barriers in the ocean. When we call those very strong barriers, we call them uh, biogeographic barriers. And those are the, the most uh, readily identifiable biogeographic barriers. They separate almost completely different faunas. So the faunas between uh, the two or on the two sides of those barriers, they're at least 20 or 30 percent different, in some cases much more. So the East Pacific barrier here is the open ocean, barrier, open ocean uh, area between the islands of the South Pacific and the East Pacific. So we have very diverse heath reefs here in the South Pacific. The islands are a lot, uh, very close to one another. And then you have 4,000 kilometers of open water. So that distance is so, so big that even a lot of the larvae, even with the pelagic larval stage, a lot of the fish cannot cross. The isthmus of Panama barrier, is, it's, even, it's an even stronger type of barrier. It's a land barrier between the Caribbean and the East Pacific that formed about three million years ago. And I will uh, talk a little bit more detail about it in uh, a few slides. Uh, the Amazon barrier is just the freshwater outfall of the Amazon in the north, northeast and South America here. There's so much freshwater and mud and sediments coming out of the Amazon that there's no reefs that form in the, this entire area. So it forms a, about a 2,000 kilometer wide barrier separating Brazil and the Caribbean. The Mid-Atlantic barrier is a barrier that is analog to the East Pacific barrier. So again, it's an open ocean barrier with no reefs. So there's no reefs, there's no uh, uh, reef fish. The Benguela barrier is a cold water barrier, so there's a cold water current that comes from the Antarctic here, and when it arrives in um, southern Africa, all of that cold water comes up, and then it, it uh, stops all of the larvae that are uh, from, of uh, coral reef fish larvae that are coming from the Indian Ocean to, to, to stop them from entering in the, the uh, Atlantic Ocean. The old world barrier here is the one that is formed when the, uh, formed about 20, 15 to 20 million years ago, when Africa collided with the Middle East and then closed again a land barrier, so it would be similar to the Isthmus of Panama barrier, except that it's a lot older. And the Sunda Shelf barrier, so all of these, are, uh, all of these islands here in Southeast Asia, including Borneo, the Mojo Islands of Indonesia, everything here, when the sea level drops, this whole area becomes a large peninsula and everything is connected, and the water flow between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean diminishes a lot. So with less water flow, there's less larvae crossing that. So there's a big difference between the faunas of those two oceans. Now those barriers, they cause speciation, they cause isolation, and they cause speciation. And uh, there are several ways that we can find species that were formed because of those barriers. Uh, the way that um, I've been using the most uh, recently is genetics. So we look at species that are widely distributed, they're considered to be one species that are distributed across those barriers, so in both sides of the barrier. When we look at the genetics, sometimes we find differences, sometimes we don't, and when we do find differences, we, we consider the different species. So I'm gonna go through uh, an example of uh, two species that I've looked at recently, a surgeon fish and a wrasse. They're widely distributed in the Pacific Ocean. Um, we collected uh, both of them in a lot of locations within Hawaii and also throughout uh, the Pacific. The ends here are the number of individuals that we collected. A lot of the times we fish for them, we get samples in, uh, in uh, fish markets, so we just need a little piece of fin clip to do the DNA sequencing of those guys. A lot of the times we use nets and we, we capture the fish and then we clip the fin and then we let the fish go immediately after that. So there's several ways of collecting, obtaining those uh, 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 tissue samples. And within Hawaii, we also looked at a lot of uh, islands within the Hawaiian archipelago. So this is the Hawaiian archipelago here. And the reason why we did this was because when looking at the genetics, not only you can get to the questions of whether those populations are uh, one species or not, or, or, but you can also get to the question of whether those populations are actually strongly connected from a demographic point of view or not. So we wanted to know here in Hawaii, so the large scale study comparing Hawaii to the Pacific was to know if the species was actually one species or several different species. The fine scale study within Hawaii, looking at several locations within Hawaii, was to try to uh, address the question of if 
the uh, populations in the main Hawaiian Islands were connected to the populations in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And it's important for us to know that because the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, so all of these islands here are part of a marine sanctuary. They're protected area, they're marine protected area. And uh, the more larvae exported from this area to the main islands, the more effective this, this marine protected area would be considered. So if there's a lot of, sea, if these islands here are exporting a lot of larvae to Hawaii, they would be considered an effective marine protected area because you can still collect fish or do some fishing here in your fish, you'd be replanted from lar with larvae from the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. If those populations are relatively isolated from one another, then the marine reserve is there just to protect what's there so it doesn't export propagules to other places. So we had those two uh, questions in mind. And the first one that we addressed was uh, the connectivity within Hawaiian Islands, so the difference of populations between the Hawaiian uh, Islands themselves. And we found out that there is a lot of migration both ways between the Northwest uh, from the Northwest Hawaiian Islands to the main islands and from the main islands to the Northwest. Now, because the prevailing currents in this area here, they flow from the main islands towards the Northwest Islands, intuitively, would, and the results also show that there's more migration from the main islands to the Northwest, but there's also a lot of migration on the other way around. So that the islands, the marine reserve in this case, is um, exporting larvae to the main islands, to the fish islands. Now, the, the result within the Pacific was the same, even though the geographic scale is uh, a lot bigger. So the distances here between the sampling points that we did in the Pacific are much larger. So the islands of the Pacific are separated by a lot more water than the islands of Hawaii. Uh, yet, we found no difference between those four populations in the Pacific. But the picture was very different when we looked at both combined. So this um, might look like a little bit of a complicated graphic at first look, but it's really not. It's really simple graphic. So every circle of these represents one DNA sequence. So we collected a whole bunch of species. In this case, it was about 600 uh, uh, tissue samples. We collected a whole lot of, uh, a lot of tissue samples from, the, from this particular species. And every tissue, tissue sample represents one, or we sequenced them, and they gave us one DNA sequence. Every DNA sequence that we got is represented by one circle in this graph. So the bigger the circle, the more individuals had that sequence. So let's say this circle here, there was about 50 individuals that had the exact same sequence. So we have a big circle. The small circles are unique sequences. And the lines are the differences between the sequences. So this small circle here is separated by, by this big one by one mutation, one line. So everything connects together nicely within Hawaii. Everything connects together nicely within, within the Pacific. But between the, the Pacific and Hawaii, there's about 25 mutations, which is a very uh, large difference. And that told us that the Hawaiian, pop, the Hawaiian population and the Pacific population were actually, actually different species. Now, this fits in a lot of those definitions, but it doesn't fit in some of the others. For example, we didn't test if they were actually reproductively isolated or not. We didn't put them in a lab and try to spawn and see if they were reproductively isolated or not. But they do fit in a lot of these, uh, a lot of the other definitions. And lately, we're taking the uh, conservative approach or the cautionary approach of calling, I mean, if we have enough support of calling what we think is a species, we actually name it as a species. And that is because species are the basic unit for conservation. So if we have a, a species that we think ranges from Hawaii, all the way out to Australia, and we think it's a one species, there's gonna be one management strategy for that one species. But if we call that Hawaiian population a different species, then there's gonna be a different management strategy for that. So with that in mind, and this result was shared by both, I mean, it's a little bit different because this one is just the surgeon fish result, but this result was shared by both the surgeon fish and the wrasse, so we named uh, both of them different species. In the case of the surgeon fish, the, um, uh, there was also slight morphological differences. So on top of doing all the DNA work, we also do all the morphological work. We count spines, we count rays, we count scales, and uh, we see if there's other differences. So in the case of the surgeon fish, uh, gill raker, the number of gill rakers was overlapping, but there was a significant difference uh, between the two populations. 
And because of that, we went ahead and named the different species. So this one is the Pacific one, is now Acanthurus nigraris, and the Hawaiian one is Acanthurus nigris. And the true grasses, one uh, maintained the name Helicaris ornatissimus, the Hawaiian one, and the Pacific one was, we described as Helicaris claudia. And claudia, by the way, was named uh, in honor of my wife, and that publication came out, luckily enough for me, like a week after our 10-year anniversary. So that was really lucky. <laughs> all right. So uh, all of the studies were within species. We also use DNA, we also use DNA sequences to look at relationships between species. And that also gives us a lot of clues of why uh, reefs are so diverse. Uh, one of the genera, one of the groups of, of fish that we looked at was this genus uh, Himulon, which uh, is composed of uh, uh, fish that are commonly known as grunts. It's about 19 species. They're restricted to the Americas. They're in both sides of the Americas. Uh, they're not up here in California, though. They're tropical species. Uh, they're commercially important. They're not very large, like snappers or groupers, but they are good food fish, and they're used for subsistence uh, fisheries in a lot of places. They attain a very large biomass. There's a lot of them out there. And they have a relatively short pelagic level stage, but it's very little known about them because they're not as flashy and not as colorful as the other coral reef fish. So everybody goes to the reef, they want to study the beautiful, colorful wrasses and the angelfish, and they leave those ugly grunts uh, to the side. So I was the lucky one to get to study them. So because there's about 19 species, there's uh, nine in the East Pacific and 10 in the Western Atlantic. And I thought, well, the isthmus of Panama is that strong geographic barrier there. There's half of them in each side. Let's just talk a little bit more detail about the isthmus of Panama. So there's uh, half and half in each side. I thought the isthmus of Panama was, be was going to be the one thing that was responsible for that divergence there, so for the formation of several species in one side or the other. That is the case in a few groups out there. So this uh, general uh, overview of the history, the, geolog the geological history of uh, the isthmus of Panama here, about 15 million years ago, there was a lot of islands, and the, the light blue here corresponds to shallow water. The deep blue is uh, deep water. So the dark blue is deep water. So there was a connection between, this is the Caribbean here. This is the um, uh, Eastern Pacific. So that would be South America, and that, that would be Central America. That would be South America here. Uh, through tectonic processes, plates moving around, and the uh, islands uplifting, there was a lot of islands that were formed here and South America uh, was pushed towards Central America, so the two of them connected, and there was a point at three million years ago where the connections were completely closed. So that closure of the connections caused uh, the formation of what we call sister or sibling species. And this is a pair of species of grunts, a pair of species of butterfly fish. They're very similar, they're very, uh, uh, they look very similar, and they were obviously formed by these splits. They were, uh, uh, they are found one in each side of the isthmus, so we can conclude that they're obvi obviously formed by that split. Uh, now, the grunts, since half of them were on one side and the other half on the other side, I thought that was going to be the case, and uh, I thought I was going to see exactly that. So now, let me show you another scary graphic here. Um, it's just as easy to understand as the other. Uh, this is a phylogenetic tree. All of the branches here simply, so each one of these tips, you don't need to read the names of each of the tips, it's just the name of the species, so it doesn't matter for what my point is here. But each one of these tips of the tree represents one species, and the closer the species is, the closer the tip is to the other tip, the closer related the species is to the other. So in, I shaded in blue all of what we call closely related sister species. And the numbers here, which you're probably not seeing either, uh, they're small numbers, but the higher the number, the closer it gets to 100, 100 the more support there is for the relationship between the species. So uh, trust me when I say that all of those numbers are close to 100, if you can see them, but they are relatively close to 100. Uh, so the, the indicating that there's a strong support for the relationship, the sister relationship between the species here. So, because of the isthmus of Panama, I thought that all of those pairs here were going to be split by the isthmus of Panama. But that was not the case. The only pair that was split by the isthmus of Panama was this one in red here. So the red one is the only one that has one species in one side of Panama and the other species on the other side. All of the blue pairs 
represent species that have almost exactly the same geographic distribution. So they're not separated, at least at present, by any, uh, any geographic barrier. And the tree on the left side is the mitochondrial DNA tree. The tree on the right side is the nuclear DNA tree. They're just two trees showing the same thing. So just to give you a couple of examples, uh, this one is one of those pairs, Helicaris, uh, uh, Himelon, Maculicalda, and Himelon Flavigutatum. They're two uh, species of grunts again. Uh, the red here is the distribution of these species. The blue is the distribution of the other. So they're very closely related species. Let's go back to the tree just one second. This is that pair there, Maculicada and Flavigutatum. So they're very closely related. The branches here are very short. And they have almost exactly the same distribution. So I thought there was something going on there. That's not the only case. There's a lot of other cases. In this case here, there's three species in the exact same branch that are very closely related. And they have, I just had one map here because they have the exact same distribution. So in the Goina Reef, anywhere in the Caribbean, anywhere within that area there, you're going to find the same three species. Now, these three species here are a really interesting case because they are not only very closely related, they are also intermediate in a lot of characters. So when I went on and I looked at their morphology, this guy in the middle here is actually intermediate in morphology between the other two. And also in genetics, when we split the mitochondria and the nuclear DNA, this one is always intermediate. And that gave us, uh, or made us propose the hypothesis that this one is actually formed by the hybridization of these two. Not, on, not only in morphology they are like that, but also half of the species of the genus, they have, so all of the species in the genus have these, they're relatively colorful when they're adults, but when they're juveniles, they are silvery with those black stripes going along the body. But half the species of the genus, including this one, have a dark stripe that starts over the eye and stops above the, um, the gill cover. And the other half, including this one, have a black line that starts on top of the eye and then go the, goes all the way down and connects to the other line in the middle of the body. Now, this one species here is the only one with the intermediate character there. Even in development, they're intermediate. So we, we, we're trying to propose now that this one is actually a, hi, a, a hybrid cross between those two other species there, which is a, a case that is not very often proposed for vertebrates. It's a lot of that proposed for plants and demonstrated in plants, but not, not really in animals. Now, with all of that in mind, all of the species occur in the same area, this potential case of a speciation by hybridization, uh, we started thinking that there has to be something else that might provide uh, opportunities for isolation between populations of these particular group of species. And then we looked at this pair here, Plumieri and Cirrus. Again, it's the same tree, just with the red arrow showing which the pair is, Plumieri and Cirrus. Those are two Caribbean species. Um, they are found in the same reef. This one is Emilon Cirrus, is this guy here. This one is Plumieri, is this guy. So they formed a school together, yet they're very closely related in the, the phylogenetic tree, so they're sister species. Now, the reason why those species are called grunts is because they grunt, they produce noise. And this is the noise that they produce. This is one of the species, Himilon plumiera. Produce the noise by grinding two types of pharyngeal teeth, so they, they have teeth on the top of the, on top of the mouth and bottom of the mouth, and they grind those teeth together and they produce those sounds. And this is the other species, remember, the most closely related species that there is to this other one. It's a completely different type of sound that they produce. So we think that by using those sounds and a few other things, a few other characters that are unique to this group, they can actually become isolated without having to have a barrier uh, separating them. So another interesting case of uh, phylogenetic relationships and speciation in fishes. Switching to the Pacific Ocean now, let's take a look at some angelfish. So this, the group that we're going to be talking about now is pygmy angelfishes. They're very common in the aquarium trade. A lot of these species here are in the tanks that we see in the aquarium uh, just downstairs. Uh, this particular species here, uh, Centropigi rolliki, has the uh, red range. 
and the yellow one, Centropegia flavissimus, has the green range. When you look at those two guys, you would never question if they're species or not. They're very similar, or they're very different looking, very striking <laughs> color patterns. And it starts getting a little bit more complicated when we start adding species. So a very interesting characteristic of this guy is that it's not only present in all of this area here, but also in those islands. There's two islands here, Cocos Kili and Christmas Island. But it's absent from this entire area. So there's what we call a disjunct population. It's a separate population out there. And then there's a third species in the group, Centropegia abli, which looks somewhat like Centropegia vrolicki, but has those bars there. And it's mostly an Indian Ocean species. I wouldn't want to make a very large map because the names are going to be too small. But it's a mostly Indian Ocean species that overlaps with vrolicki in this area here. Now, what complicates this system even more is that in the areas that they overlap, so in those areas here, they form hybrids. This is a hybrid between these two. That is a hybrid between those two there in this area there. So in the areas that they overlap, they form hybrids. Now, we had three species. We looked at their genetics. We did the same thing that we did with the other one. And the phylogenetic tree that we got was this one here. So again, looks complicated at first, but it's very simple. Everything in this branch is very similar to each other. Everything in this branch is very similar to each other. Everything in this branch is very similar to each other. And if you go from one branch to the other, there's a lot of changes. So we have three species, three named species, and three genetic branches. Three branches are formed uh, when we do the phylogenetic analysis, when we put the, C the DNA sequences together and see which ones are closer to which ones, except that the genetic tree doesn't coincide with the species tree. So the species that we have here, Vrolicky, well, this particular branch here, which is supposed to be one of the lineages, is composed of these two morphs, the yellow one and the gray and black one. The central one is only the yellow one, and the bottom one is the yellow one and the, the gray with bar one. So the yellow one is found in those, the, the, all three branches, and uh, the gray and black is only this one, the, the Bard is only that one. We're still trying to understand why uh, this is going on there, but we think it has to do with the fact that they hybridize, they form hybrids in all of these uh, overlapping areas here. So what we think is going on is uh, there's one species that started developing here, and then it spread throughout the range. When it overlaps with the others and crosses, it transfers the genetic material to the other species but somehow they still keep their color through selection, through uh, some other process that we're still uh, trying to understand. So just to give you another idea of how striking that the discrepancy between the genetic tree and the species designation is. So this is the distribution of the species. The yellow one is the green, the uh, gray one is the orange here, and the bars is the purple. And this is the geographic distribution of the genetic lineages. The, one of the genetic lineages is all over the place here. There's one genetic lineage that is only there, and it's only these guys. And there's another genetic lineage that is mostly Indian Ocean. The completely uh, the opposite of what we see with the species. Now this particular case gets even more interesting when we add a third component to the uh, system which is this guy here that is not the same species as this. It's a different species from a different family altogether. So these are angelfishes, and these two on the bottom here are surgeonfishes. They are mimic surgeonfishes. They, they're mimics of the angelfish. They imitate with a very high degree of perfection, I might add, uh, the uh, angelfishes. And the reason for this mimicry has, has been unknown for a long, long time, until 2004, a group from Australia published a study showing that. Uh, so there's, uh, if you ever gone diving, or if you ever took a time to look at the, the coral, the, especially the big Philippine tank here, you notice that every reef has a very nasty, very aggressive type of fish, the damselfishes. Damselfishes are small, and they're very aggressive, and they're herbivore fishes. They eat plants, and they keep little territories that some people refer to as farms. So they literally farm algae inside their territories. And the best algae in the entire reef is inside their farm because they don't consume all the algae inside their farm. So they keep the algae. There's a very diverse algal community inside their territory. And every other, any other fish that is, eats plants that gets close to their territory, they chase them away. They try to bite it. 
So the best algae in the entire reef is inside the Dams of Fish territory. Now, they don't, they don't want to spend a lot of energy, so they don't chase fish that eat other things from inside the territory. They only chase the herbivores. Now, the uh, surgeon fish are herbivores, but the angelfish are not. The angelfish are spongivores. So by looking like the spongivore angelfish, the uh, surgeon fish, they gain access to the territories of the damsel fish, and they gain a feeding advantage over other surgeon fishes in the area. So their diets is about 30 to 40 percent better in nutrition than the diets of other surgeon fish in the same area that don't have access to the damsel fish territories. Now this question is particularly interesting because the uh, surgeon fish, they're a lot small, they're a lot larger than the angelfish. So the angelfish, they only go to about two inches, but the surgeon fish, they get maybe eight, ten inches long. So when they grow bigger than the angelfish, they change color into an adult color, and they move to a different habitat in the reef. So the adults of these surgeon fish, they look exactly the same throughout their ranges. They don't change. So we still consider the different, spe the different colors of surgeon fish the same species. And it gets even more interesting because in areas where there's hybrids, so in the overlapping areas there, the surgeon fish mimics the hybrid. So we're starting to think that the surgeon fish actually have some sort of, of say in what they will mimic. So we think that uh, we're working under the hypothesis that uh, if they settle, when they're larvae, they don't have the color yet, when they settle to a reef, they try to find the angelfish, and when they find it, they get the visual information, they, uh, they trigger some genes that make them look like either one or the other. There's still a lot to be uh, studying on that. So still on angelfishes, uh, this is a different, it's the same genus as the other ones, Centropegis, the pygmy angelfishes, but it's a dif different group of three species. In this case, only two species here. So Centropegis ferrogata, uh, the uh, range of the species is up north here, all the way up to Japan. Again, the map goes up here, but uh, Centropegis lauriculus is widespread throughout the Pacific. And recently, uh, we discovered there's a hybrid between these two, which is intermediate coloration, so the thinner bars, more orange in the area where they overlap here in central south, the Philipp central south Philippines. Now, this in and of itself wouldn't be very interesting, except that there's a third described species of Centropegi called Centropegi stripardi that occurs in those islands here, not overlapping with Lauriculus or Ferrugata, and looks exactly like the hybrid that was found in the southern Philippines. So morphologically, if we put those two together in a tank or send any expert in angelfish out there photographs of those two guys, uh, they would say that they are the same species and they would be this one, Shepardi. But when we do the genetics, we actually see that this, this uh, particular uh, fish here that is coming from the Philippines is a hybrid between those two. So our new uh, uh, hypothesis to explain this situation here is that this, this particular species here was a result of a cross between those two that developed in isolation in those islands there. So at some point in time during the past, a few of these fish from this species colonized this island, a few of these colonized the island, all of them became a hybrid there, and the hybrid became isolated from the, both parental populations and then eventually became its own species. Now, all of those uh, hypotheses, they're interesting, uh, they're enticing, they're nice, uh, but we actually need a lot of data to uh, uh, support them. And um, at, they, they have what we call circumstantial evidence. And the only way that to get a lot of evidence to support those hypotheses would be looking at this comparative genomics. The problem is that comparative genomics is very expensive to do still. I mean, it used to be, now not so long, not anymore. So, come into the, what we call next generation sequencing. Uh, the first human genome published in 2001 costed $2.5 billion. Today, with this, uh, what we call next generation sequencing, we can, you can sequence a human genome for about 50,000. So that's the decrease in price that there was. Um, I used uh, one twelfth of a run of this, this machine to produce data for uh, some of the uh, Hemulone species, some of those grunts, and I produced a lot of that, more sequencing than I have ever done before for any species of fish, and it cost me just a couple thousand dollars. So um, we're getting to a point where we can actually use a lot of this information uh, 
from next generation sequencing to address some of those uh, problems. And that we're, that's what uh, we're doing now, we're focusing on doing now in our lab. So just to summarize this uh, first part of the talk, um, recent genomic data from several plants and animals indicate that genomes are porous, so that uh, there's that crossing of genes between species. Uh, and then the neutral genes are capable of crossing the species boundary, but the ones that code for color, the ones that are being selected, they don't cross as easily. Now, evidence from reef fishes suggests that speciation with gene flow or speciation uh, in the same habitat, speciation without uh, physical isolation is actually possible and might be quite common in the sea. And the next generation sequencing is finally uh, cheap enough that we can actually use it to answer some of those questions. Now, I wanted to talk to you about a little bit about um, deep reefs in the study that I've been doing with deep reef fishes. So, we know quite a bit, we know a lot about the shallow, uh, shallow reef fishes. There's about 5,000 species known of shallow uh, reef fishes. Uh, we estimate there's about 5,500 of them out there, so there's another 500 or so to describe. Um, and interestingly enough, every new species of uh, shallow water reef fish that we find is fairly similar to one other species that we knew before. So it's a little bit of color there, a little bit of genetics there. Uh, in the deep reefs, uh, there's a very different uh, story. We only know about 100 species, and we estimate there's about 1,000 of them. So we don't know 90% of the species in deep reefs. And it's not just taxonomy. Every time we find a new species on the deep reefs, uh, it's very different morphologically, genetically, and habitat-wise from um, everything that we described from the, shallow, from the shallow reefs. Now, what do I mean by deep reefs? So the shallow reefs would be the top 200 feet or so of water in, in a given reef. Uh, and uh, we call that shallow reef simply because we have lots of access to it with normal scuba gear. So we just strap your tank to your back, and you go down with a little bit of caution. You can go down to 150, 200 feet or so. Um, so anything under 200 feet would be deep reef. And below 500 feet, it becomes too dark, and it's not a reef anymore. Um, so this area in particular, we call it a twilight zone, <laughs> it's um, uh, very hard to explore because it's inaccessible by diving, by normal scuba diving. Uh, you need a lot of technical uh, background to go dive in those depths. And it's also inaccessible by uh, submarine. The submarine is very large, very bulky. Taking a submarine to examine those reefs here would be the same as trying to explore a, a rainforest using a helicopter. It would just be rovering around the reef and not actually collecting anything. So, and not to mention it's very expensive to hire a submarine to just go collect fish. So this is uh, what a diver would look like with a normal scuba gear to try to explore those depths. And because of the water pressure, and you need a lot of more air to fill your lungs back at depth. So you'd have to carry all of, of these uh, uh, tanks to actually do a, a meaningful dive at those depths and bring something back. So because of this, because of the logistical problems, all of the studies of deep reefs, they were uh, not done previously to the mid-90s or so. Uh, but when the, the mid, uh, during the mid-90s, uh, this technology we're calling the rebreather technology became available. And uh, what a rebreather does, contrary to what an open circle dive does, so in, with the open circuit, you, you breathe the air in and you exhale the air in the water. So all the bubbles come out, all of, all, most of the oxygen that you take in, actually you dump it out back in the water. With a rebreather, when you exhale, the air com comes back into the system and there's a filter in the back that takes all of the uh, carbon dioxide out and then gives you the, the oxygen back. So with this, with this equipment here on my back, I have more autonomy. I can stay longer at depths than this guy here, just because I recirculate the air and filter all the CO2 out. So with a rebreather, we actually have the freedom to collect fish, and it, logistically, it's a lot easier to use than, than uh, all of these apparatus here. So now we're having, finally having access to those deep reefs. And this is what we're finding. So since the early mid-90s, those are the pioneer, pioneer expeditions by Rich Pyle. Rich Pyle is a, a researcher at the University of Hawaii. He's the one that first started doing this. Um, so during the, uh, since the expeditions from the early 90s, I mean, we, invariably we find new species in all of the expeditions. This is the number of new species that we found, so anything between 12 and 40 plus, 45, 46 species. 
Uh, this is the exploration time that we spent diving. So between 2.8 and 4.5 hours of exploration. And with those two numbers here, we calculated this, which is the number of new species discovered per hour <laughs> during those deep dives. So we're getting about four, between 4.3 and 11.2 new species per hour of diving at those depths. That's how unexplored those depths are. Um, we have know very, very little about it. And the, uh, the Fiji expedition here, in particular, is disproportionately high as opposed to the others, because Fiji was the only one where everybody was concentrating only on collecting fish. All the other expeditions, we had to collect sea stars, crustaceans, we had to do filming, photograph. This one, everybody was just collecting fish. So the number is potentially much higher. And this is only fish, and fish is a vertebrate, is something that is very well known. If you extrapolate this to crustaceans, to mollusks, to sea stars, the number will grow exponentially really, really fast. So with that, um, I can't do all of that alone. I have a lot of funding agencies to thank. My lab, my wife helps me a lot with the, all the genetic analyses. Uh, students also, my slaves. <laughs> And uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. <laughs> so I've got a microphone here, and by a show of hands, I'll come around the room and take your questions. Thought I saw one in the front. Oh, there we go. Um, yes, could you clarify why you um, tend to attribute the, the third species as a hybrid of the two rather than a, going the other direction as a common ancestor? Which, which one of them? Why, why any of, any any of, of the cases. Any of the cases. You've got two that are similar, and then you have a third one that is related. And right. in all cases, you thought it was uh, creating a new species right, through right. hybridization. Right, right. Why is it that you don't think of it as a common ancestor? Right. So that was the first thought we had. And then we uh, sequenced more and more DNA. And we started seeing that uh, the DNA of the potential hybrid was actually a mix between the DNA of both parents. So some of its genes, uh, when we run the analysis with one gene, it would put that potential hybrid together with one of the parents. When we run the analysis on another gene, it would put it together with the other parent. So this flipping between one and the other is pointing us more toward the, uh, the hybrid hypothesis than, the, uh, than the, the other one, than the alternative. Fantastic presentation. Yes. Thank you. Regarding the uh, new species that you have discovered, how, how deep did you go for those? And do you actually have to, can you uh, get DNA sequencing samples? Or do you have to take the fish? And if that's the case, I'm curious how many you had to take to get the um, 125 species, I think is what you said. Right, right. And, and then the, the final thing, I found it really fascinating that you said um, that you know it's really important to understand the species, what's a species, mm -hmm. because it is the basic unit of conservation yeah. management. So maybe you could also talk about what you think the implications of your, your work in that regard. Right, right. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to start with the last portion of the question, the conservation, the uh, conservation implications. So I have a, a, actually I have a clear example. There was a species of parrotfish. Um, widely distributed in the Atlantic, both sides of the Atlantic, that was considered a single species. It occurred in the Caribbean and in also in coastal Africa, and we just split it in two different species. Now, because it was widely distributed before, the IUC, you know, we're familiar with the IUCN red list? So the IUCN runs, they make a red list and they categorize the species into endangered and, and not endangered and critically endangered. They have a lot of categories too. Uh, uh, list species. And uh, the least uh, uh, endangered species, they put it in at least ca the least concerned category. So, go figure, it's name, just nomenclature. But uh, when you say that a species is least concerned, it's because it's, it's not threatened and it's not endangered or anything. 
Uh, and this paired fish used to be least concerned because of the wide distribution and because there was a lot of marine reserves in the Caribbean where it was present. Now the species in Africa is also the same size, it's also the same paired fish, but it's heavily fished in Africa. Now because I split them into species, the one in Africa now is going to enter into some sort of category that is near threatened, and the other one in the Caribbean is going to remain least concerned because it's not fished and uh, it's present in a lot of marine protected areas throughout the Caribbean. So that is, is one of the uh, outcomes of that. Regarding the collection of the fish, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, when it's a lot of them, we try to, so we, we use barrier nets and we chase the fish into the barrier net and we catch them with their hands and then we take a fin clip out. We just need a tiny little piece of fin and then we let the fish go. Um, for genetic analysis, we just need a tiny piece of fish of, of fin. For describing a species, we actually need a specimen. We need a specimen and we need to put it in a fish collection, which we have one here uh, on the other side, not the live, not the aquarium collection, but we have a collection on the back side with jars. And uh, for the describing a species, we have to have an actual, what we call a voucher specimen. So we have to have a physical specimen that if somebody else finds a similar fish in the future, it can go back and compare to that to see if it's the same species or not. Now we need between five and 10 for describing the species, because we have to have a relatively good range of, uh, of uh, characters so that people fishing it or finding it in other parts of the world, they can look at and they can assign their species to that one species. So for describing it, we need between five and 10. For the genetic analysis, we need a lot more than that. We need 20 or 30 or so per location. But a lot of the time we try to, uh, we try to either get the tissue samples in a fish market for the fish that are already there, or we try to, to uh, not kill the fish, we try to grab them with their hands and then uh, clip, it, clip the fin and let the fish go. Was that the only two questions? Oh, well, the rebreeder, the depth is between 300 and 400 feet. So between 100 and 140 meters or so. And the, the deeper you go, the more new species there are. <laughs> Our next question comes from the back of the room. I'm wondering if the fish can survive being brought up from those depths or if it's not significant and you are just planning to pickle them. Right, right. Uh, you mean to put it in an aquarium? Whatever you might want okay, to do. Okay, yeah, yeah. So um, it's, it's delicate. So every fish has that swim bladder. It's a gas bladder inside their body to get used to regulate their depth. So if they want to go shallower, they put a little bit more air on it. And, and it's just to swim, be neutrally buoyant, not be heavier than the water. They have that, uh, that gas bladder. When you bring it back from the depth, I mean, if it's it, under pressure, the gas expands and then the, the fish eventually dies if you bring it very fast. If you want to bring it back to put in an aquarium, you have two options. You either bring it very slowly, and by slowly I mean taking days. There's a person to go up. If, I, if a, a diver stays 15 minutes at, let's say, 100 meters, to come back up, it will take two and a half, three hours. So we have to come back very slowly and do the decompression stops so that the nitrogen that we absorb in our tissues slowly comes back out when we're coming up. Now for the fish, because it actually has a, a an organ that is filled with air and there's no other communication. They're not like lungs. They don't have communications with the, uh, with the outside. It has to be a lot slower than that. So if you wanted to do it properly, if you wanted to keep the fish alive, it would take days to come back up. Uh, if you're a very experienced fish collector for the aquarium, you can actually use a needle and then go through the side of the fish and make a hole exactly at the right spot. And then that fish, most of the time, if you do it properly, will survive. But um, a lot of people actually are experienced on that because some of those fish, especially the ones that come from the deep reefs, they're worth tens of thousands of dollars. You wouldn't believe it. And we'll return to the back of the room for our next question. I was wondering when your research, either in shallow or deep reefs, if you found anything similar to the rapid speciation in Lake Malawi. Right. There is one right here off of California. It's not in the same magnitude, and it's not my own research, but I like the example, though, because just because it's here. But the rockfishes of California are one example of uh, what we call a species flock, a rapid speciation event. It's not as rapid. There's nothing compared to cichlids. Cichlids, 
are evolved in the last 10,000 years or so, or 20,000 years. Um, this, the rockfishes were a few hundred thousand, but there it's, and it's a lot less species too. It's only 70, 75 species. But they are an example of a, a, an adaptive radiation or a, a recent species flock. In my work in particular, I haven't found any yet. And the next question on your right in the back. I was wondering if, how old is the oldest reef fish? Hmm, that's an interesting question. How old is the oldest reef fish? Um, some groupers, so the, one, the way you can tell the age of the fish is by looking at their ear bones. They have bones inside the ear that uh, grow as the fish grows, and they accumulate minerals. So as they accumulate minerals, when the seasons change, temperature changes, the calcification rates change in the, ring, in, the, uh, in the bones, and they leave rings just like tree rings. So you can section those bones and count the rings and tell how old the fish is. Uh, I think the oldest reef fish on record is probably a damselfish, one of the tiny aggressive ones that is about 60 years old. Yeah, they're, they're small, they, they grow, but they, they, grow, and they grow fast, but they just stay there for a long, long time, so if they don't get killed. Groupers are relatively old, too, and parrotfish. Um, gobies, the tiny little ones, are the ones that have a very short life cycle. They, they are born and die within one year or two. But some fish, they live a long time. Surgeon fish can live up to 20, 25 years. Some of the fish that we have here in those tanks have been here for 30 or 40 years or so. Um, and that's reef. Uh, if you go to colder waters, the temperate waters, the fish live, in, live even longer, so. Yes, I noticed that there in, in the maps you have, there are very large areas uh, across the Pacific. Right. And is there a circu circulation of fish in one direction, all directions, or, and the second part would be the reef fishes, are there slower to move from one section to another? Okay, so the, the prevailing currents in the Pacific are usually from uh, the central Pacific towards Indonesia, uh, but that changes with El Nino. So with El Nino, the currents flow the other way. So it depends, uh, and every 10 years it changes. Um, it's relatively constant, but uh, it, it can change with, with, even within our life, both within our lifetime and with uh, evolutionary time. Uh, as far as Traveling speeds, there are some fish that are faster than others. There's a lot of study being done in, uh, in uh, larval biology in reef fishes now to actually look at the swimming capability of, of larvae. So there's some of those fish that have a 30-day pelagic larval stage, but they all are only found in one island, and nobody knows exactly why. So with a 30-day larval stage, you'd imagine that they go out in the current and they colonize everything around them. But we're seeing that some of those fish, they actually can swim against the current and stay close to the island where they were born. So there's a whole different line of study, but there's a lot of people studying it too. Uh, do you know if there's one or more species of reef fish that occur around the world? And if so, how do you explain that with the different barriers that exist? Right. There, uh, around the world, there's like two or three species that are we call reef, but not exactly reef. And the more in detail we look at them, the more we see that they're not actually one species. So the barracuda is one example, that great big barracuda with the bad nasty teeth. Um, it's one of the species that is it's relatively tied to the reef, but it also swims out in the open ocean. It used to be considered one species around the globe. Um, and um, there was a recently stud recent study that was published looking at the genetics that, uh, that saw that most of the populations in the Indo-Pacific are connected, they're similar, but the Atlantic ones are different. So even when it's one species, it's, it's different. And uh, the ones that have those very, very large distributions, they tend to have a very, either a very, very long larval stage, or they tend to have some mechanism that allows them to disperse when they're adults. So the, the barracuda is a large silvery fish, and sometimes you find it out in blue water. It's not as sedentary as the other reef fish. 
So as far as reef fish go, typically reef fish, damsel fishes, butterfly fishes, wrasses, you don't find them with that kind of distribution. Yes, I, um, <clears throat> I was curious as to whether or not you see evidence of um, <clears throat> mutations occurring um, in the fish life, perhaps uh, due to um, environmental factors, pollutants or whatnot. And then if that does occur, how do you distinguish that from a new species? I mean, how would right. you be able to discern, is this a mutation or is this actually a new species right. or are they one in the same or would right. they be one in the right, same? Right, 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 interesting question. So, um, uh, I'll give you an example of one island. Yeah, actually, let me try to do something here. I have a photo, so I'll start talking and I'll start doing the other thing at the same. Oh, no, it's not my laptop. Uh, it's my presentation, but not my laptop. See, I'm too used to giving talks with my laptop. I had a photo of uh, a surgeon fish. There's a beautiful surgeon fish in the Pacific that has blue lines. It's called the blue line surgeon fish. And I found one population in uh, Christmas Island that had the lines all wiggly. And I had no idea what that was. And I thought it was, at first, I thought it was a mutation. And I thought, well, in, if I sequence their DNA, they're going to be all the same because they're going to be probably from the same mother. So I brought samples of everyone back to the lab and I sequenced their DNA. And it turned out their DNA was different. So they were from different uh, uh, parents. And I thought that it was some kind of chemical that was coming out in the water and causing that mutation. Now, uh, the, the mutations like that are usually, it doesn't take much for, for a, in a change in the genetic code for something like that to happen. If there's one gene that controls the formation of that line, those lines that was affected by the chemical, then all of the fish were going to be affected, we're, we're going to have the, the lines like that. But the genes that we look at to produce those trees are neutral genes. They're not the genes that code for that specific uh, uh, wiggly line. They're what we call neutral genes. They're genes that are not supposedly not under selection. There's still a lot of debate about that, but uh, they're as neutral as you can get. So it's a gene that is supposedly under no effect from uh, external causes. So by looking at those neutral genes, we can exclude the possibility of that being uh, the effect of one, uh, one single mutation. And the other way we can avoid that too is, is uh, we never describe a species based on, on one individual or a few individuals. We usually look at several hundreds across the range. And then it has to be consistency between different locations. We'll take our final question from the front row. On the question page, what kind of fish were those? Which one? On the, the question page? Yeah. They were grunts. Uh, I do get that. I was, I was finding strange that nobody had asked me that question. <laughs> Everybody asks me that. And uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. And everybody asks me what they are, not only what they are, but also what they're doing. And they're, they're grunts. They're part of that same family that I said there was the hybrid one. And um, we know so little about those fish that we don't know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> we think, we think they're, they're, they're fighting for it because they, they live in huge, very large, 100, 200, 300 individual schools in the Caribbean. And we think that they're uh, fighting for dominance or to see who is first in the school or something like that. But there's no studies done. So if you want to study fish behavior, nobody knows what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, please join me in saying thank you to Dr. Luis Rocha.